I'm Ash Bennington, Senior Editor and Crypto Editor at Real Vision. I'm very excited today to talk to Mark Yusko, CEO and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mark, welcome back to Real Vision. Oh, Ash, great to be with you. Always fun to talk about big ideas and uh, no one I'd rather do it with than you. Yeah, fantastic. You know, last uh, time we spoke a couple of weeks ago, I guess we had on our crypto guys hats and now we're talking about traditional capital markets and SPACs. You know, our last conversation was just such a blast. Uh, we should do that more often uh, with Raul and, and yourself. So, uh, But I am excited to talk about uh, back in the traditional world, which has been most of my career, uh, even though I'm spending a lot of time in digital assets these days, yeah. but uh, pretty excited about what's going on in the SPAC world. Yeah. You know, obviously, we're doing this as part of a campaign uh, about the potential or the risk for bubbles. Uh, and the topic of this conversation is, are SPACs a bubble? But I think before we start talking about the, the pricing and the bubble features, it's important that people get an understanding of the big picture here, what SPACs are, why they matter, and how they fit into the broader landscape of structures that companies use to raise money. So look, I, I thought maybe what we should do is, <laughs> I say this all the time, let's, let's go back to go forward and uh, do a little bit of history. I actually did a presentation recently called What's So Special About Special Purpose Acquisition Companies and kind of went through the history and, and, and to your point, why is this transition happening? Why are more and more companies choosing to go public using a SPAC merger versus a traditional IPO? Well, there are lots of reasons, lots of good reasons and, and why I think this trend is, is really in its early stages. So. If we go back to the time at which the SPAC legislation was created, it was really created to allow companies that were shut out of the traditional IPO process mm. by either the underwriters or you know, by the, the, the process itself. Uh, you had to have a lot of history and track record to find a way to get funding. And so uh, they created this blank check re uh, legislation which is where the, the idea of blank check comes from. And what that means literally is you raise the money in advance of deciding or announcing what company you're going to merge the public shell uh, into the private company. And so uh, the challenge was in those early days, and we're talking 50, 40, 30 years ago, um, the challenge was the best companies with the best management teams and the best sponsors were admitted to the club and they got to, to do the traditional IPO market. So unsurprisingly, some of the lesser lights found their way into the SPAC world. And what I think was, was really challenging about that was uh, it was dominated at that time by industrial companies because you had to have a certain amount of track record and history. And un unfortunately, financial sponsors who were looking to unload some of their uh, let's say, lesser quality merchandise. And uh, I think what's really interesting, they actually did a study in the you know, middle 2010s, and it looked back and it said that, look, if you did a SPAC, you know, a special purpose acquisition company offering with an operating team, you know, somebody like an energy team that was going to go merge with an energy business or a, an industrial team that was going to merge with an industrial business, you actually did well. Unfortunately, if you bought into a financial sponsor that was really unloading something that they couldn't do a traditional IPO, unsurprisingly, the returns were bad. So what they did in 2015 is they modified the rules around SPACs. And Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. IPO, unsurprisingly, the returns were bad. So what they did in 2015 is they modified the rules around SPACs and allowed for a couple things. One, uh, they went away from having so much demand for historical track record and operating history and profits. 
And my first boss, you know, I had this, this great first boss at this value equity shop and, and he had this great line. He said, no truly new idea can, by definition, have a track record. So if you think about it, if, if you're a new company in a new industry or a new business, a growth market, how do you have an operating history? How do you have profits? Really, it's about the future, not, not the past. So, so that was a big enhancement. And the, and the second thing they did is they, they put in some rules about um, conflicts of interest and alignment of interest. And make a long story short, in 2010, 60, 60 percent of SPACs had to liquidate after the two-year uh, investment period. They couldn't find anything to merge with. Okay. By 2015, that number was down to 20%. That's pretty good. Last year, 0% had to liquidate. And so what has happened is this medium of, of raising capital or, or getting public, really, it's not really about so much about raising capital, it's about going public and getting a public vehicle, a public currency, uh, has become, we believe, the preferred method for high growth, innovative, as we refer to them, the companies of the future to go public. And Ash, there's, there's a great blog post by Bill Gurley. Bill Gurley, famous venture capitalist at Benchmark. And he writes a blog called Above the Crowd. And he wrote this blog post about, if you think about the three ways of going public, right? There's a traditional IPO. There's a direct listing, which we've seen a number of in the past year. And then there's a SPAC merger. You think about the traditional IPO, one of the reasons that suddenly there's this you know, urge to find a better solution is the extreme kind of craziness of, I'll call it misappropriation of wealth on that, that first day, that IPO pop. And what that is, if you think about it, who gets to decide the price of that IPO? The underwriters. Well, who gets the benefit of that IPO pop? Not the company, not the employees, not the original owners. It's the fat cat clients of the underwriter. I don't get IPO shares. I don't know about you. Maybe you're a high roller. Maybe you get IPO shares. Most people, most individual investors do not get IPO shares. You have to be a very high level client at you know one of the big underwriters. A cynic might say, Mark, that it's functioning exactly as designed. <laughs> well, absolutely, uh, as is the Fed and all the other things that are designed to transfer wealth from the poor to the rich. So yes, topic for another day. But it is designed to do exactly that. And so what Bill talks about in his blog post is one way to defeat that uh, gap and put that money in the hands of the company and the employees and the owners is to do a direct listing. But he said there's actually a better way, which is a SPAC merger. And, and why is it better? Well, SPACs are lower cost. So the cost of going public through a SPAC is less than a traditional IPO. They're more flexible in terms of uh, the ways you can structure the, the uh, issue itself and the types of companies that you can merge with. And the uh, management is selling off a minority share into this public shell, which allows them the flexibility to decide when they issue more public stock. So all these things became attractive. And so what you've seen since 2015 is a rise in the popularity of SPAC mergers. But why the boom last year? Now, last year was the year of the SPAC. 2020 was the year of the SPAC. Record number of SPACs, a little over 90. Record amount of money raised in SPACs. In fact, more than the last 10 years combined. And most importantly, an all-time record for the percentage of IPOs that are a SPAC. Uh, so about one out of every four IPOs was a SPAC merger last year. So if we think about that, why did that happen? Well, I trace it back to a seminal event, which was Chamath, right? A very influential and successful, right? Self-made billionaire, very successful venture capitalist, really good operator, created a uh, series of SPACs, IPO, A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, I personally would have skipped F just because I'm superstitious, like the 13th floor, not being in many buildings. But uh, IPO, A, uh, he decided to merge with Virgin Galactic. So there's this great picture of Richard Branson, arguably really 
successful dude, um, not even arguably, uh, and Chamath up, you know, ringing the bell of the NYSE whack back when you could do that live. And uh, I think that made people realize, wait a minute, though, that's a real business. Those are real people. Okay. And so if you follow since that time, these high growth innovative companies have started to migrate. And the most important reason is if you're a company where your best days are ahead, not behind. So look at the last year's SPAC mergers. Two thirds, maybe 70% were in five industries, space travel and exploration, autonomous vehicles, electrification, um, online gaming, and esports. Those are businesses that are in their infancy. It's like buying Amazon in, you know, 1998. It's like, you know, buying Google in uh, 2005 when they bought Android, when people laughed at them. So these are early, early days of things like mobility and autonomy and uh, esports. So when your best days are ahead, you can't go to the public and say, look at my 10 year track record and look at my series of profits. You have to make forward looking statements. You have to be able to tell your story. You have to be able to articulate a vision for how big the total addressable market is. None of those things are conducive to the traditional IPO. In a SPAC, you can say all those things and you can build the story that investors can buy into. And I, I use the example of Amazon, okay? Amazon has been a public company for 21 years, right? Very volatile stock. It's had an average drawdown of 31% in those 21 years. Every single year, average is 21, 31%, twice greater than 90%. How many people bought Amazon at the IPO 21 years ago and held to today? I would say Jeff, his mom and dad, and now his ex-wife. That's it. Everybody else was shaken out by the volatility. They didn't understand the vision. They didn't understand the whole differentiated world. Everyone said it's been overvalued since day one. And everybody's been saying it's a bubble. But it just keeps generating profits and uh, opportunity. And I think that's the difference between a growth company, right, and a, and a value company. And these best high growth companies uh, backed by great venture capitalists, backed by great innovators, backed by great science, are going to create incredible wealth and value in the future. And people are going to complain the whole time that they're overvalued or they're a bubble. Um, so we get very excited about what's happening in the space. And I think you summed it up so perfectly in saying, wait a minute, isn't this really not about the bubble, but about this transition in how companies access the public markets. Yeah, and it is for precisely all of those reasons that you just enumerated, right? That this this is a question about how uh, these companies are going to begin uh, this process of accumulating capital. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating conversation more broadly about all of the points that you just made. But to transition a little bit to talk about what your positioning in the space right now is, uh, tell us a little bit about the ETF. Yeah, so look, one of the things that that is interesting about uh, the market environment we're in, and you're doing this whole series on this market environment, right? Are, are we in a bubble? And the answer is yes, we're, we are in a bubble, but that's a broad market bubble, right? SPACs are a legal structure, right? Saying SPACs are a bubble is like saying mutual funds are a bubble or hedge funds are a bubble or limited partnerships are a bubble. It's just a legal structure. Are there individual companies in the equity market that are overvalued? Absolutely. Are there individual companies that are in the markets that came public through a SPAC that are overvalued? Yes. Are there individual companies that came public through an IPO that are overvalued? Yes. Oh, but are there companies in each of those categories that are undervalued? Absolutely. Look at energy companies, right? There are a lot of energy companies that are up a lot this year because they got wildly undervalued last year because they were thrown out babies, babies with the bathwater. Right. So when you think about the world we're in, We've been in a world where we're just drowning in liquidity, right? There's just massive liquidity from the central banks. And what that does is it creates an incredible environment for passive investing. Now, it's a myth because it's actually not passive. It's just slow. I mean, it's not passive. It's actually slow active, right? 
over the last 30 years, 85% of the companies in the S&P have changed. That's not passive, right? That's active. It's just slow active. And so passive is simply capitalization weighted indexation. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's a momentum strategy. You buy more of things as they go up. So what we have is a bubble in indexation. We have a bubble in cap weighting strategies. And that exacerbates itself right up until the point, like in 2000, where you were maximally exposed to tech, or 2008, where you're maximally exposed to financials. And today, you're maximally exposed to tech and biotech and a few other things. And so the bubble is in the valuation of the sectors that are overvalued. But the markets are filled with pockets of, of opportunity. So we came out with uh, an ETF, and we came out with an actively managed ETF, not passive, not indexed. Why active? Well, active and passive over the last 50 years have exactly the same return. Shocking, right? Well, how can that be? It's, you know, active has lost for the last 10 years. Well, yes, it has, because we have a business cycle and a liquidity cycle. And when liquidity is ebbing, I mean, when, ebbity, when liquidity is flowing, passive wins, indexation wins. When liquidity is ebbing, active wins. So we believe we are going to be in an environment soon where liquidity will have to be contracted from the system because we've put too much into the system. And ultimately that will favor active management. The second thing is in a world where you believe that there are individual companies that are wildly overvalued as we do, we don't want to buy them just because the model says we should. I talk about this all the time. So let's say you're a, an ETF that, that buys home builders, right? And just buy home builders. And you buy home builders and all of them trade at six, seven, eight times earnings. And another home builder comes out and they claim to be a tech company and it comes out at 40 times earnings. Why would you pay for a cyclical business 40 times earnings? Well, you shouldn't. But if you're a passive capitalization weighted index, you must buy that company in the weighting that it comes out at. So if it comes out at a high price, you have to buy more of it. Illogical. So we take a value approach. I'm a value guy and our partners at Exos are, are great value and, and they're actually great technical managers, quantitative managers. Uh, the combination is that we believe equal weighting will be superior going forward than cap weighting. We think that actively uh, focusing on identifying the companies of the future. So identifying the industries that are focused on innovation. You know, our big thing at Morgan Creek is innovation as an asset class. We've talked about that. That's why we love Bitcoin. That's why we love lots of things around digital. Um, but innovation as an asset class is really important. And we believe the greatest innovators are going to come public using SPAC mergers. We think that those businesses and those industries are going to create incredible wealth going forward. And so we want to get in front of those trends and hold them. More importantly, we want to avoid the losers, right? And what separates the great investors from the average investors is great investors do two things better than everybody else. They cut their losers faster and they let their winners run. In fact, they double up. Yeah, I had this great experience. Julian Robertson was a mentor and, and friend for many years. And uh, I got to talk with him for, for hours and hours and hours. But more importantly, uh, maybe not more importantly, but equally importantly, I got to talk to all the people that left his shop that we backed as Tiger Cubs and Grand Cubs. And I had these notebooks filled with notes. I should make a book out of it, actually. And one of the insights that they all shared, every single one of them, you know, from Chase Coleman to Dwight Anderson to Lee Ainsley to, you know, every, all of them, Steve Mandel, all of them, they all said Julian had an uncanny ability to double up, that he would do the opposite of what the average investor does. The average investor waters their weeds. They think they're right and the market's wrong. So they double down and they pull their flowers. As soon as something goes up, they take it out because they're afraid they're gonna lose their profits. And so the average investor underperforms for this reason. And, and you know, Peter uh, Lynch said the same thing. He said, the way to win in investing is to water your flowers and pull your weeds. And uh, I think the same thing's true here. So our job in SPXZ, which is the ticker symbol for the, the ETF, is to intentionally 
try to avoid the really bad ones. Right. And if we do that, right, if we take care of the losses, the gains will take care of themselves. We'll stay long, the great companies, despite the fact that people say, oh, they're overvalued and this. We're just going to stay long until such time as the market tells us that we're wrong, right? The markets will tell us the prices will decline and, and we'll move on to the next great idea. But we, we don't want to make the mistake of selling Amazon, you know, in 2002 right. when it was $7 and people sold it and they didn't buy it back until it hit, you know, 2000. So I think that's, that's really the key. Yeah. And, and Amazon, we've had talked about this before, was underwater for years uh, after the 2000 collapse. And that's the way things work, right? Is innovation is hard. Creating new categories is hard. I mean, remember, it's not that long ago, maybe a decade ago when people said, oh, e-commerce, it's a fad. <laughs> no, we'll never buy stuff online. People like to go to the store. People would never put their credit card into a computer. That's not safe. I'd much rather put my credit card in a computer where it's encrypted than give it to someone at a store, which is the first time I had my credit card stolen. I gave it to the dry cleaner. By the time I got home, she had charged 700 bucks worth of stuff on my credit card. Um, thankfully, Visa paid, paid it instead of me. But I think what's really interesting about the current environment is there's so much focus on trying to find the bubble, right? To find the cause and to find when it's going to pop and, and how we can protect ourselves. But, but really, we should spend our time doing what we always do as investors, is identifying big, durable trends and owning those trying to avoid the scams and the, and the bad people. I, I did in my presentation on, on uh, you know, what's so special about SPACs, I did a picture and I put up the picture of Richard Branson and Chamath. And I put up a picture of a former congressman, a former author, and a former Goldman Sachs operating executive, not an investment guy, but an operating executive who were also contemplating doing SPACs. Like, which one would you rather back? I, I don't know. And you now you got entertainers and you got, you know, sports stars doing SPAC. And look, do I think all of those will be bad? Absolutely not, right? If Shaq did something, I'm in. The guy is a great business person. If LeBron did something, I'm in. The guy is a fantastic investor. You know the guy who I met that no one would believe me is a great investor? Chameleonaire. Yeah. I saw this guy. He was at a conference I was at. And, you know, to be honest, I thought he was there for eye candy. Right, he was there with Kaepernick and a bunch of others, and all the you know glamour people from the venture industry, you know, a thousand people big. And I thought he was just there as as kind of oh look who we got to speak. And the guy got up and started talking about his investments as the first money into the autonomy company that sold to Ford, and his early investment in Uber, and talking about autonomy and his vision. I'm like, I'm in with it. This so our perceptions about who's good and who's bad aren't always right. Right. And so you have to do the work. And so that's where we focus is doing the work, being active and trying to, you know, step back from this, oh my gosh, everything's a bubble to, hey, DraftKings, perfect example. Um, we invested in, in DraftKings pre-IPO. So we invested in a convertible bond in DraftKings. So we thought, look, this is an interesting and compelling business model. Now, we knew they were in conversations with a, a SPAC to merge, Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp. And eventually they did, right? And it came public at $10. Now, the cool thing about that, everybody on the planet could buy that at $10. Hmm. They didn't have to pay 30 or 40 or 50 bucks. They could have bought it for $10. But people didn't, sure, weren't sure it was going to be a big deal, or maybe they were overpriced. No, all you had to do is think, is this a big trend? Is someday... Are sports going to resume? Are people going to bet on sports again? Are people going to find other things to bet on? And, you know, sure enough, it's many multiples of that today. Now, do I think it's highly valued today? Yes. Um, do I still own it in our portfolio? Yes. Do I watch it like a hawk? Yes. Well, actually, I don't. The portfolio manager does. But ultimately, that's a great business in a great industry run by a great team that's executing really well. And what I think is really neat about it is all you had to do is buy Diamond Eagle, Diamond Eagle at $10 and you got a share of that. Or buy IPOA and you got a share of 
you know, Virgin Galactic or IPO C and you got a share of Clover Health. That was a, that was another great one, right? Um, how do you make those selections, by the way? And how do you think of in, in the portfolio weightings as well? Yep. So you make the selections just the way all of us do our jobs, right? Experience, relationships, you know, reference checking and 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 a little bit of gut instinct. And where's gut instinct come from? From making mistakes, right? We all are are better at our jobs from from the mistakes we've made in the past. In fact, my my good friend, a hedge fund manager, has this great line. He says, is, he has it written on the wall as uh, you walk into his office, this guy, Bill Duhamel, and uh, says, with every investment, we become richer or wiser, never both. <laughs> and it's such genius, right? Because it's absolutely true. When you, when you do something and it works out, you never analyze how you, know, how you made the decision or whether it's good. But when it goes wrong, you get wiser. And so uh, the way we, we try to avoid the bad management teams is we evaluate what have they done in their history? What are they focused on? Like if, if a sports star came in and said he was going to raise a SPAC to go after, you know, pick something, electric vehicles, probably going to be a little more dubious of that if, than if a sports star said, you know, I want to own a sports franchise. I've been involved in sports and I think sports franchises only go up because there's always somebody with more money that's willing to pay for it. It's an interesting company to be a part of, Green Bay Packers, things like that. Okay, that's interesting to me. Conversely, if an energy team came and said, you know, we want to go do a Bitcoin SPAC. <laughs> nope, not interested in that. Um, if somebody from the crypto side said they wanted to do a SPAC, they'd probably be pretty interested in that. Or someone from FinTech went after a FinTech. But if a FinTech group came and said they were going to go do an old world industrial manufacturing company, probably not interested in that. So part of it is just, you know, matching strengths with with opportunity. The other is, look, we've all met people who you know immediately you want to give them money, <laughs> right? I mean, I, yeah. we both have a good friend, Raul, right? I've, I've known Raul a long time. And, and the minute he started talking to me about Real Vision, I was like, I'm in. And I'm an investor, full disclosure. I love the business. I love what you guys do. Um, but you just you just feel it, right? That that's an entrepreneur who's got a vision, and and you wanna you wanna be side by side helping him execute. Right. Well, as you said before, you mentioned uh, the conversations you had with Julian Robertson. We now, via technology and innovation, get to bring those conversations with the next generation of investors to the world. Pretty cool. Exactly. So cool. And and to preserve that that brilliance. And again, was he always a brilliant investor? Mm, not really. I mean, he was he was a pretty good broker for many, many years, but he really wasn't an investor. And he met, you know, A.W. Jones and he he learned the craft of long short and he figured out through trial and error, uh, mostly not a lot of error, but he figured out through trial and error what, what worked and what didn't. He had his, his infamous, you know, trip to try to be a macro guy like like Soros. And that was not his his ballywick. But man, when it comes to long and short, the, the guy is is uh, without peer. Part of that, I think, he had a great line, um, never fudge the numbers. He would ask an analyst, you know, what, what, is, what are the numbers? And the, the analyst would say, oh, well, I think. Is, I didn't ask you what you think. He said, what do we know, right? Give me the numbers. And if, and if this guy started making stuff up, like, never fudge the numbers. Just go back, do the work, and, and come back to it. So, plus he had an ability to do math in his head like, like no other. But ultimately, um, we're not going to get them all right, right? So we think we have an edge. You know, that's our big thing um, at Morgan Creek and me personally, right on my Twitter stream, hashtag edge. I think we have an edge in that we have great data on the history of SPACs. We've analyzed it and we found some patterns and some trends that say larger cap SPACs are a good fishing pond. I'm, I'm a fisherman. Like I, I love to fish. If you go to Colorado, and you go to a gold metal trout stream, you'll catch fish, right? Even if you're a bad angler, you'll catch fish. But if you're a good angler, you will catch trophy fish. If you go to a non-gold metal stream, I don't care how good an angler you are, you probably aren't going to catch many fish. So we think we can get to the gold metal trout stream, which gives us a higher probability, but we'll still make mistakes and we'll still fall down the river and fill up our waders. But um, that's okay if what we really excel at by having this data 
and seeing where the blowups have happened and where when things start to go bad, they don't self-regulate, right? This idea that, oh, it went from $10 to $9. Oh, that's a value. I should buy it. Nope. That means they made a mistake. Or I mean, our data says that means they made a mistake and you just move on and find another good idea. Um, and there are a lot of them that actually will go to zero. So avoid those losers, try to focus on the right industries, the right sectors and the right teams. And I, you know, I believe in the four P's, right? There's people, philosophy, process, and price. Most people focus on price. They see whatever's moving, that's what I want to own. Whatever's done well, is what I want to own. It's the last place you should start. In fact, you know, with managers, you should do the inverse. You should find a good manager, the great long-term track record, just had a crappy period. That's who you should give money because they're, they're going to mean revert. Uh, we focus on people. And if you're, if you're with good people, uh, their philosophy needs to be good. Their process needs to be good. But if you're with good people, people of integrity, people who are you know, uh, competitive, people who, who want to win, uh, don't like to lose, uh, which are different, I think all those things matter. Yeah. So now that we've made the case, we understand the structure and we've talked a little bit about what the upsides are. Some of the things that I know you've heard before, this is the bubble talk. This is the, the thing that you hear people saying uh, around, these, uh, around these deals. The first and the most obvious is just there's too many dollars chasing too few good deals. Look, um, there is no question that with the excess liquidity in the markets, there are lots and lots of pockets of overvaluation, lots. And, and SPACs are not immune to that. There are certainly individual SPACs um, that I believe are, are overvalued. And what I think is interesting about that is, is that doesn't mean that the SPAC process is broken. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, migrate to, to looking at what the SPAC merger represents in terms of an opportunity set high growth companies, innovative companies, companies of the future, all those are positives. But the fact that a handful or some couple handfuls have become overvalued because a lot of money has been chasing them, that didn't change the, the, the positives. Um, I think the challenge we have right now with markets broadly, uh, you know, equity markets broadly are the most overvalued they have ever been, right? They've now surpassed the 2000 peak on every level, right? Whether it's PE, whether it's price to sales, whether it's price to EBITDA um, or EV to EBITDA, uh, all of the multiples, market cap to a GDP, all of the multiples and indicators that we look at all say we're definitely in a bubble. Now people will try to justify that saying, oh, but interest rates are low and therefore we can, we can uh, have pay higher prices. Well, let's take that to its illogical extreme. If interest rates are zero, are stocks worth infinity? I don't think that's how it works. And I think what it what it is is, again, people have a hard time with exponential math. Yeah. And the same way, the same reason people missed Bitcoin, right? Because they don't understand the exponential growth of networks, Metcalf's law that we talked about last time. The thing that they miss about um, falling interest rates is below two percent, you start to get a parabolic decay of the value of the Fed model because interest rates below 2% are a sign of economic weakness, not strength. And they're a sign of need for additional stimulus. And stimulus, if you read Lacey Hunt stuff, I know you guys have had Lacey on, uh, crowds out private spending and lowers growth and decreases monetary velocity. So all of the talk about inflation and uh, growth and all this thing is gonna happen with the stimulus, it's not true. Velocity keeps falling, growth keeps falling, and it's it's money illusion. And part of the reason that the nominal price of things are going up so much is because the currency in which we value it is getting destroyed. So over the last three years, equities look like they're up, but that's because we're denominating them in dollars. If you denominate in gold, you're actually down 20%. If you denominate in Bitcoin, you're down a lot. So What's happening is the currency is being destroyed and the nominal value is rising. That's called money illusion. And it's true of every, you know, banana republic in history, right? Best foreign stock market in the world in 2006 and seven was Zimbabwe, 
right before the Zimbabwe and right over behind on my desk, I have a 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollar bill, right? An original, wouldn't buy a loaf of bread. And, uh, you know, last best performing stock market last three years running, not the United States, Venezuela. Would you want to own Venezuelan stocks? Heck no, because the Bolivar went to the toilet paper. And that actually, it's, it's called the dictator playbook, right? What does a dictator do? They concentrate all the wealth at the top of the pyramid with their cronies, and then they devalue the currency. And they all get rich, and nominal value of stuff goes up, and people pay ridiculous prices for art and collectibles, and stores of value persevere. So gold, silver, um, you know, fine assets, and, and ultimately cryptocurrency, which is why Bitcoin is, is so poised for greatness yeah. here. Yeah, and then you, of course, apply capital controls. Oh, well, then there's that part too, which, which makes it even more fun. And look, when I think about all the cacophony around bubbles and, and particularly sectors that are bubbles, um, like, like con, the, you know, the SPAC bubble or the IPO bubble, well, it is axiomatically true, right? And I, I, I say it that insiders don't sell at bottoms, right? Just axiomatically true. And insiders know more about companies than, than us, right? The rest of us that are not insiders. And so, yes, when insiders are selling, okay, when IPOs are happening and insiders are selling, that's usually a bad thing. What's interesting in a SPAC merger, there's not a lot of selling going on. It's a very small, most SPACs are pretty small. There's not a lot of uh, selling going on in terms of shares. So compared to a traditional IPO where you know management might be selling huge swaths of their company, um, I think you probably find more overvaluation there. And if you look at, at some of the valuations in the traditional markets, uh, yeah, some of the traditional IPOs, look, my son works at Snowflake and I'm really happy for him but I don't get the valuation. I mean, I don't understand how a company can sell at 200 times revenues. I think it is one of the great companies of our age. I think 10 years from now, we'll look back. I'm not sure we'll say we wish we would have bought it at these prices, but we might. But I know we'll look back and say, this is one of the great companies of our age in terms of completely revolutionizing how we manage and use data. Uh, great company. But 200 times revenues is, is a stretch for me. Um, and there are, you know, we're using the company right now, Zoom, right? At 100 times revenues, pricey. Do I think it's a great company? Absolutely. Do I think it's great technology? Absolutely. Would I own that stock in my portfolio? No. Would I go short? Not right this second. Yeah. There's a big difference between not wanting to be long and deciding that you want to go short, especially in these markets. Amen. Yeah, I'm curious about one of the things that we've talked about, and it's been implicit in some of the other uh, points that you've made about uh, fluctuation uh, of, of market prices. When you think about the SPAC market, when you uh, think about it as an investor, uh, talk to us a little bit about time horizon uh, and what you think is because it's such an important factor. Uh, obviously, we're talking about uh, we're talking about Amazon being underwater for multiple years after the 2000 crash. What are your thoughts about that? Such an important point. And, and I think we have to, again, step back to go forward here because there are different time horizons for different elements of the life cycle of a SPAC. So if you think about the life cycle of a SPAC, there's really four different points of investment opportunity. So there's pre-IPO, right? You can buy into companies that you think are likely to be a target of a SPAC merger. So private companies, you can buy convertible bonds, or you could buy some equity, you could buy preferred shares, you could participate in a, in a venture capital mezzanine financing. And we've done that with companies like Lyft and Uber and, and Facebook and, um, well, we did it with, with uh, DraftKings. And so you can, you can make those. Those are hard for the average investor because you have to be accredited or qualified. And part of the challenge is companies have been staying private longer so more of that wealth creation has been going to the fat cats. So what a SPAC actually does, it will truncate that period. And a lot of these unicorns that were probably going to stay private a long time are now going to go public because this SPAC merger is more flexible and a better structure. So that will put money in the hands. It will democratize access to those private companies. The second way you can buy is from the 
IPO of the SPAC to the deal announcement. Okay, so intra period, you buy the, the unit at $10 and you get warrants, usually up to about 10% that you can exercise at, at a later time. So at a fixed price. So in that period, we actually have a fund, it's a private partnership, a hedge fund. Um, and it basically does what's called SPAC arbitrage. So I can buy the IPOs and I wanna buy them all. And then I hold them up until the time at which the deal is announced and I sell. Because when I sell on that deal announcement, the great thing about the change in the rules in 2015 is my money sits in cash in an inviolable trust invested in treasury, so I get a cash return. And on the deal announcement, I get the choice as a unit holder to say, yep, thumbs up, I wanna participate, or nope, give me my money back. All of it, plus interest. And I get to keep my warrants. So if you get cash return and my warrants, and the companies on average do well, those warrants have value, and we have been compounding with bond risk. Because remember, I get my, my worst case scenario is I get my money back plus a cash return, no downside risk, and we've actually been compounding well into the mid-teens. It's a pretty nice deal. So that's one way of investing in SPACs. So then you've got the question about what to do on the, the announcement. Right? You can choose to participate. You can choose to get your money back. So you could do arbitrage or you could enhance your arbitrage by exercising your warrants. So you can decide I want to you know, stay in or get out. But independent of that, you can decide what to do with your warrants. So there's, a, there's actually a play where you could go buy warrants in the market because it's kind of like why spinoffs underperform in the short term and then outperform in the long term because there are certain owners you know if a company owns if a, if a asset manager owns a company and it's you know in their uh, universe of companies they're allowed to own and it spins off well that spin-off no longer meets their criteria it's not the right capitalization it's not the right industry so they have to sell it so there's short-term pressure well it's a good company so people go buy it and it does well long term same thing's true here there are certain funds that aren't allowed to own the warrants so they sell them and they trade at a discount. So you're getting free return by buying an asset, for, you know, a dollar for 90 cents. Nice, nice place. So that's another place to invest. Right. Not, not available, obviously, to all retail investors the same uh, way that uh, it would be. Although working. you can buy warrants in the, in the traditional market. Um, they're, they're, they're not as liquid, but, but they're definitely out there. Um, uh, so the third, or the, the, the third part of the life cycle is post-announcement. So that's the combination. So this goes back to your question about time horizon. My arbitrage is sub two years, right? I buy the IPO, I hold to the deal announcement, it averages about 18 months. That's that's it, that's what I'm gonna own. My pre-IPO deal, I'm gonna hold for six months because that's my lockup, all right? In the post-merger, my goal, <clears throat> our goal in SPXZ is to hold for a long time, right? We wanna own the companies of the future and we want to own them for a long time as they grow and develop and build. What does a long time mean in this context? Years. Years, right? I mean, now, are we going to be lucky and get all Amazons and hold them for 21 years? Probably not. But we would expect to hold many of these names for many years. Now, will there be times? I'll give you a great example. So we have a risk management overlay in our strategy that says, as much as we love an industry, we okay, we love electrification. As much as we love that, and we love, you know, um, electric vehicle production. Nikola, you know, did a SPAC merger, and it zoomed up, and then it rolled over, and there were allegations of fraud. And as soon as it triggered our technical sell, we just sold it. Doesn't matter that we love the industry, love the sector love the idea um, and believe that there will be a competitor to the Cybertruck. It violated our risk management rules, so we sold it and that was a good sell. And so there will be times where our goal is to hold the company for a long time, but something happens. In this case, it was allegations of fraud. Maybe it's a fraud, maybe it's not. Now, let's say those allegations get settled and it turns out they do deliver trucks and everything's great, 
will probably own that again. But in the meantime, there are 14 other companies we can own in that space. And I think that's why active management, I believe, is going to win long term in this space, because what you're dealing with are growth companies that are going to be volatile and a capitalization weighted or a passive index, I think, is going to end up missing a bunch of, of, of great opportunities. Now, the one thing it will do well, it will own the biggest, most successful ones uh, over short term periods. And there'll be periods where it outperforms like in a bull market, um, but in a choppier market or an environment where uh, there's just more volatility, I think that's where the active management and the risk management is going to kick in. Well, you know, talking about management and the life cycle here, I was reading that I think about two thirds of the SPACs uh, in, in the ETF will have chosen a partner and one third will be shell companies that are still seeking startups. Yes, and that's exactly right. So, so we we focused on innovation as an asset class, the sectors and industries, and then the sponsors that we think are great. Right, we happen to like Chamath, so unsurprisingly, we own his SPACs. Uh, but there, are, you know, he's not the only one. There are other sponsors that we think are very good at their job at picking great companies. And what are some of those attributes that you look for in those sponsors? Uh, again, I think part of it is you know we we tend to like investors, right? People who have been investors in the past. So um, whether it's you know financial investors, I, I prefer venture capitalists or growth equity investors. Private equity is okay too, although SPACs are more about innovation and venture than they are about you know stripping out costs and and mergers and acquisitions. So I, I probably prefer venture capital to, to private equity. There's a technological aspect to it. Many of the things that we're focused on are, are technology oriented. So we probably have a bias toward technologists and people who have, have demonstrated either operating history or or background in, in certain technologies. Um, but then there's there's an element of innovation or or entrepreneurs, you know, people like the DraftKings guys, no one would say that they were experienced operators, right? They're young guys, but they had a really great idea and they executed well and they brought in good partners. And um, so there we partnered with Diamond Eagle because we thought they had a good insight into to making the, the DraftKings acquisition happen. So um, so it's a good target focus, something we like. So said if if an operating team with energy background tells us they're going to go do green energy, we're probably going to back that pre-IPO. I mean that uh, pre pre combination uh, spat. If it's uh, somebody who is kind of we just don't see it, right? Former congressman, I'm probably not going there. Um, Post combination, it's all about the companies of the future. What are the industries we like? What are the sectors we like? What are the companies that we think have great managements? And then let's try to avoid, you know, the stinkers. So when you see criticisms uh, coming out from the space from sophisticated places, like there was a recent Goldman report uh, that warned of bubble-like sentiment in the SPAC market, what's your reaction and what's your interpretation of what they're seeing? So I'm well known for my disdain for Wall Street research. <laughs> I always say, and I tweet about this, right? Uh, do as they do, not as they say. I actually used to keep track of this, that the big Wall Street house research reports were incredible at being inverse indicators of what you should do. So if they said to go long, you should go short. If they said to go short, you should go long. Why? Well, it's because their prop desks were taking the other side. And maybe that's cynical of me, and maybe that they don't have as much prop desk activity today. They still do some. Uh, maybe they're better, but my experience, my experience, my personal experience over a pretty long time has been that you should discount what they say. Second part of it, you know, these are the same people that they have so much to lose as incumbents that they have to criticize, right? It's like Jamie Dimon or Warren Buffett criticizing Bitcoin. They have to. 46% of Berkshire Hathaway is financial services. Jamie Dimon, 100% is financial services. They must criticize technology that could replace or displace the banking system as we know it. 
so is it a shock that companies that issue traditional IPOs say bad things about the competition? Not shocking to me. Okay, so bearing in mind that there have been these criticisms and that they are coming from a place that uh, obviously has a position or a view, uh, what are some of your thoughts or advice about trying to avoid some of the risks in this space for people who are interested in it? They've been hearing about it. Uh, they're curious. But what are your ideas about how they can potentially avoid some of those downsides? Active management, risk management, diversification. Simple. The things that we should do in every asset. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's like, it's like when I talk about Bitcoin, right? I, I never tell people to put 100% Bitcoin. Should you put 3%, 5%? Absolutely. If you're young, should you put 10 or 15? Absolutely. But I'm not talking you to put 100. And same thing here with SPACs, right? If you're trying to pick single SPACs, do you have the time, resources, inclination, and discipline to do the work on 400 SPACs? I don't know. Most people don't. I don't. That's why I have a team that does the day to day stuff. And my job is to, you know, think about the industries we want to target on, focus on and think about the sectors and and be a, a, a resource for evaluating management teams. But, you know, I'm not going to do the models on 400 companies. That's not my job. And I that's not my you know, I say it's above my pay grade. So I think rifle shooting is dangerous in a highly valued market. And that's true for all securities. I wouldn't rifle shoot high yield bonds here. We just traded the lowest yield in the high yield market in history. So I wouldn't be picking single high yield bonds. I'd own a broad, diversified, actively managed index because there are some good high yield bonds and there are some really crappy ones. Uh, same thing, I wouldn't buy an index fund here in the general stock market. If you paid me, I would buy an active manager and I would focus on rotating out of what works and rotating in to things that are undervalued and, and, and then position size, right? It's, it's like the stories last or last couple of weeks with GameStop, right? Were there hedge funds that made a mistake with position sizing? Absolutely. Does that mean they're a bad hedge fund or a bad person? Nope. Does it mean they won't be successful in the future? No way. That, those funds, many of them are going to be awesome in the future because they learned a variable, very valuable lesson. They just got wiser. Right? They didn't get richer. They got wiser. And my guess is they paid dearly for that capital. Paid dearly for that capital. And, and look, that's the way the markets work. That's the way capitalism works. And I, I like that form of capitalism. I don't like crony capitalism. I like real capitalism. Where you make a mistake, you pay for it. You dig yourself out and you can earn it back. Um, trust is really important. And you, know, you got to earn back my trust after, after making a big mistake. So individuals should learn from that and not, you know, over, get overly greedy in a world where, uh, you know, let's say you bought into space early, um, Virgin Galactic, and it's gone up six times. Maybe you rebalance and maybe you look for some other things or let us do it for you, right? We created a broadly diversified, actively managed fund for people who don't want to try to rifle shoot. And, you know, the other thing you do is hold ours as a core and then rifle shoot around it. You know, cherry pick the best ideas. That's what we do in our long short fund, right? We have 70% of the money with external managers and then 30% we run internally and supersize their best ideas. And it turns out, not shockingly to you, that the best ideas of the best managers on the planet outperform the market two to one. And it's kind of cool. How do you rebalance the fund? Yeah, so every month we, uh, we rebalance back to equal weight. And, um, you know, that's hard. When things are running, it's hard to sell. And when things are going down, it's hard to buy. But as long as they don't violate our risk management disciplines and find themselves being sold, then we, you know, rigorously rebalance on a monthly basis. Because we're not churning. We do want to hold many of these things for many years. We actually think it's going to be quite tax efficient. Um, you know, it's too early to tell. We've been up for uh, a few weeks. But we think the strategy will end up being tax efficient, and um, and 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 we think it will decrease volatility, which will make people hold it longer, because volatility is your friend in investing. We should all seek volatile assets, but we should only invest in volatile assets where we get paid 
to tolerate the volatility, right? The volatility of Bitcoin is the highest of all the assets, but that's because you're paid 280% compounded per year for 12 years to endure that volatility, but the average person can't do it. So how do you do that? Position size. If it's a small part of your portfolio, you don't freak out. If I had 20% of my portfolio in DraftKings right now, I'd be freaking out, but I got two. And two, I can sleep at night because if it goes against me, I'm okay. Cause I got 49 other positions that are gonna do well. Yeah, something we talk about in Real Vision all the time. Uh, Marcus, we come to the end. What are your final thoughts? What would you like to leave our viewers with? I would say, look, uh, one, watch more Real Vision because the quality of the content and the, the scope and scale of the content are, are mind numbing and, and you just need to spend time, you know, hold up on a Saturday and, and just watch the videos because uh, it's it's fantastic. So I, th I think that's really important. I think it's more important in these types of environments. Mark, you know what our revolutionary se secret is, right? We ask a question and then we let the guest answer it. Uh, you know what? That is a, that is a, well, but to that point, answers are way less important than good questions. <laughs> good questions is what makes everything in this world work. And if you ask good questions to good people, wow, that's where the, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. So the second thing I say is, look, we are in a liquidity fueled bubble. I totally agree with your premise of the, uh, of the series. We are, but bubbles can go longer than you think. And they don't have to pop when you think and because of the things you think. And so when we say it's not different this time, it's not this Two shall pass and we will have the typical bubble, um, you know, Eiffel Tower pattern, but it won't be caused for the same reasons that 2000 or 2008 or whatever it, what it happens to be. It'll be something else. And it's always the bullet you don't see in battle that kills you. So therefore, I think caution and prudence are the things I would leave people with. You want to be cautious here. You don't want to be afraid and you don't want to play not to lose because that's how you lose, right? The prevent defense prevents you from winning. That's the only thing it does. So never, you, you always want to play to win, but don't overweight any one thing. Don't overweight any one idea. Don't think you're smarter than the markets and, and be more diversified than you would otherwise. Seek professional help where you can. Don't try to do it all yourself. I, I shouldn't talk about Coach K because I'm a Tar Heel guy, right? But the guy is so amazing. And, and I got to spend a couple hours with him once. And, and he had this great thing. And I, I'll never forget he, two things. So one, he said, you know, Mark, our jobs are exactly the same. I'm like, oh, OK, Coach, humor me. How am I in any way, shape, or form like the greatest basketball coach who's ever lived? Um, I'm not seeing it. He says, well, think about it. We both identify talent. We go out and recruit that talent. We attract that talent. We draw up a game plan. We put the team together. We put them on the floor and we sit down. I never take a shot. You never actually make a direct investment. You got a team. I got a team. We have the same job. Like, oh my gosh, I had the same job as Coach K. This is awesome. But then the really important thing he said was, look, great players always focus on the next play. Average players always focus on the last play. And so in these types of environments, it's so easy to make a mistake, miss a shot, commit a stupid foul, and obsess about that. We've all seen the player, right? They miss a shot, they go back, commit a stupid foul. A great player doesn't even remember taking the shot. Instant erasure, goes back, plays good defense, steals the ball, makes a layup. So in a world where things are happening faster, there's, there's more risk, things are highly valued, and the penalties for a mistake are high, you got to do, and I'll leave you with the real greatest coach of all time, Dean Smith, um, who said, with mistakes, you got to learn how to Ralph. Recognize it, admit it, learn from it, and forget it. And forgetting is really, really important. So be humble enough to admit you make a mistake. I, I love Twitter. Twitter, you were wrong. 18 months ago, you said this and you were wrong. Like, I'm wrong all the time. Why are you even keeping track? I forgot about that. I'm on to the next thing because I focus on the next play. So stay focused on the next play, get diversified, find professionals to help, identify talent, follow the money, follow the talent. That's what I'll leave you with. 
Always a pleasure. Mark Yusko, thanks for joining us. No, thanks, Ash. This is great. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of The Interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.